please welcome Jennifer Pratt. Thank you. Um, I just want to start with a thank you for uh, to Shalini and to Gallery We Can Call Them For for the invitation in moderating today's panel. Um, and of course, you know, just to state, of course, how, how humbled we are to be having this at the Islamic Art Museum. So thank you so much for hosting us here today. Um, we'll be talking about regional markets, both sort of on the macro and on the micro. And I thought it might be helpful for each of us here on the panel to introduce ourselves and give a little bit of context to our background before we get started. Um, so I'll just kind of give you an overview of what Artsy does. Um, Shalina, thank you for the introduction. We are the largest global platform for contemporary and modern art. Um, we are a marketplace-driven business. And what that means is that we work with gallery partners, um, as well as museums, institutions, and auction houses to showcase their inventory online. Um, I think one issue that is not siloed to the art world, but that small business these days often don't have the marketing capacity or resources to really have a digital strategy. And so what Artsy does, students, um, and so that's really our business model. And what I do here with my team in Hong Kong, Edward is in the crowd, hi Edward, <laughs> is really sort of pioneer um, the mission for the business, which is to build um, sort of a unilateral database that's accessible to everybody um, here in Asia. And so we work with different galleries here um, and museums to really bring on their inventory. And by connecting buyer and seller worldwide, we're able to create this large marketplace um, and really kind of democratize what um, I think most people think of in the art, art as a rather um, siloed business, something that really is only accessible to a certain uh, crowd, perhaps a, a more elitist crowd, a more wealthy crowd. Um, and our mission is really to say that, um, that art is for everybody, and that we hope it is ubiquitous one day to your favorite songs, your favorite music, um, and that you'll be able to appreciate and live with art on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that, I'll hand it over to Lindy, uh, Lindy Gilbert, who comes to us from the University of Melbourne. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Yes, um, I'm an academic in the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Melbourne. Uh, I've been uh, running and founded the UNESCO Observatory, the first UNESCO centre in the arts outside UNESCO headquarters in Paris. I was involved for many years in um, Asian Pacific Confederation for Arts Education. I was the director of that, and I'm vice president of World Craft Council, Asia Pacific region for the South Pacific. Uh, so basically, that's it. Um, I'm an artist. I've had 39 exhibitions, with six in New York City, about to have one in January in Lawn, in Victoria, and um, I'm currently doing a book, Educating in the Crafts: The Global Experience, a sequel to the one I did on educating in the arts, the Asian experience. I run a UNESCO journal and uh, basically it's just wonderful to be here in Malaysia and I'm very, very happy and thanks very much to you Shalini for such a wonderful event and your wonderful hospitality. It's all been fantastic. Great thrill to be here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Madhavi Peters. Um, I'm the founder of um, The Tropicalist, uh, which is a platform for regional engagement on cultural issues. Um, I, I sort of want to just give you a little bit of background uh, to this, uh, the platform. Um, so I myself, um, I have a very sort of pan-regional background. Uh, I grew up in Indonesia and Singapore and India. And then in university, I uh, studied China and Chinese. And then graduate school, um, my con area of concentration was Southeast Asia. Um, so throughout my academic career and then later on my professional career, I've been very sort of interested and uh, engaged with uh, building more of a regional conversation about you know, what we want this part of the world to look like, especially um, for the younger generation. Um, so um, yeah, the, the, the Tropicalist is, like I said, um, I'm try I founded it four years ago. Um, and you know, there's lots of um, articles there about um, uh, culture in, in different parts of the region, um, but also you know the very idea of, of what it means to be Asian, like the idea of Asia. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited to be part of the discussion today because obviously this is um, an issue that I've been thinking a lot about throughout my career. Thanks so much to Dr. Shalini for inviting me here. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dipanjana Klein from Christie's, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, it's my first time in Malaysia, and I came here not knowing what to expect. Um, Shalini has been a very dear friend and a collector at Christie's for many, many years. Um, and when she invited me, uh, the immediate answer was yes. Uh, but then what? So here I am um, to speak to you all today and be part of this panel. And uh, Jennifer, I'm really looking forward to this um, with amazing panelists next to me. Um, my background is uh, purely art history. And my focus uh, has been modern and contemporary South Asian art and classical as in antiquities, Southeast Asian, Himalayan, and Indian art. And uh, for both these areas that I oversee internationally for Christie's, the idea is to grow the market from our sale room to sale room. So we have auctions in New York and London. Sometimes we dabble in Dubai, trying to see if that market works or not. Um, and this year, 10 years after uh, having pulled out of Hong Kong, we went back into Hong Kong. So my entire um, focus is about, fo uh, about growth market for modern and contemporary and classical, and to study various market patterns to see where we can go and how we can make a difference, how we can grow the market, how we can diversify and bring in new collectors, reach out to new collectors, and part of it is also education, so that people know about the culture that South Asia offers. Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ivan Pan. Um, <clears throat> I'm the founder of a company that's based in Yangon, Myanmar, called Pan Projects. Uh, we largely define our, our, our businesses in culture, craft, and cuisine because we um, have restaurants and, and some craft businesses. And uh, in the culture part is uh, where I um, first became engaged with, with the art world and the world of, <clears throat> of uh, institutions. And that was a space, a non-profit space that I uh, that we started in 2014 on the jetty in, in Yangon as a place where people, um, artists, or can can host exhibitions and we would curate shows and have a program of, of um, music and f film events. Unfortunately, you know, due, due to some c complications with uh, um, with the our government landlord, we were evicted um, after about you know, 16 months. So, in the last three years, we've been hosting pop-up shows annually. Um, some of them local, some of them bringing international exhibitions to, to Yangon. And, uh, but I'm happy to announce that in the spring of next year, we're finally going to have a permanent space again. So I'm very excited also to be here to listen to what everyone has to say, and thank you for inviting me. So we've been entrusted to discuss some big ideas. Um, and I thought that we could start off, I wrote just a few lines, maybe set the tone, and we can go into discussion. Um, recently, following the rapid rise in growth of China's art market, dealers and collectors are already turning their attention to Southeast Asia. Any growing marketplace first needs the support of its own national collectors. Systematic infrastructure beyond that takes the form of galleries, fairs, museums, and auction houses. Um, although I do want to caveat that in Asia we are seeing hybrids of these partnerships and nuances that are Asia-specific, and maybe we can discuss that a little bit later on with Dupajana. Um, over the last 10 years in Asia, we've seen the development of regional hubs, Hong Kong for Greater China, Singapore for Southeast Asia, and Delhi for India. These locations will attract both national and international collectors, creating a cross-cultural dialogue during one very intense week. I come from a background in art fairs and digital platforms, where global art dialogues are connected. Emerging markets are often spoken or thought of as existing in their own economies. But if we are thinking of contemporary culture on a global scale, we must seek to incorporate emerging markets into the global conversation. With more art fairs geared to highlighting works from Asian artists, we are now also seeing fairs incorporating focus sectors towards the region. At our Dubai's 2016 edition, the annual curated program Marker 
centered on artists from the Philippines. The 2015 Hugo Boss Asia Art Award, organized by the Rockland Museum in Shanghai, um, extended its scope to include artists from Southeast Asia, with artists such as Mo Sat of Myanmar, Vandi Ratna of Cambodia, both making the shortlist. Um, the winner of the 2015 prize was a Filipino artist, her name is Maria Tanakuchi. And through winning that prize, she went then on to host a solo exhibit at Gallery Paratan in autumn 2016. So these are some examples of, gal of, I'm sorry, of artists from emerging regions that have kind of sought to seek visibility in larger markets um, and gone on to host their works at exhibitions and for sales on a global marketplace. Um, so I'd like to start today actually with some questions for Ivan Poon. I guess when I think of art markets, um, within the gallery we can follow the four, for example, there are 22 galleries participating. Um, and when I think of Yangon, it is an even more nascent marketplace, right? There are very few galleries as Absolutely. far as I know. I mean, there are many galleries, but I mean, not um, galleries as we, as we know them. I mean, a lot of them are, are stores, and, and they're not curated, that they aren't necessarily exhibitions, but there will just be, like, you know, a lot of inventory of, of paintings, you know, them and them. And so there are a lot of galleries, but just not um, necessarily curated or, or, or uh, with a, you know, with a mission. And they are commercially structured, right? So they yes, are selling yes. the works. Yeah. And you've made the decision then to open TS1 as a nonprofit, so a non-selling institution. Um, and I have had the pleasure of meeting Natalie Johnson, who I think you also work with. Yes. At yes. Myanmar. She's great. She was our director at TS1, and now she continues to work with us on organizing the exhibitions. But she has her own commercial platform, which is Myanmar, um, which you know she uses uh, to, 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 to promote to local artists. There. Yes. I see. Interesting. I mean, as sort of one of the two founding institutions, nonprofit institutions in Yangon, um, what was your mission there? Why did you see the landscape as requiring a nonprofit? Um, well, originally, actually, you know, we were quite fluid and we thought about um, seeing whether or not we could have parts of the, of the space that was selling so that we would have exhibitions in one part and then maybe have a gallery that actually sold you know, Myanmar, the Burmese artists, as a way of, you know, building the market. Later on, we found that, you know, it's complicated, you know, just reputationally, because, you know, to have that conflict of interest, and and, um, and we just felt that it was it was more suitable to continue on the path of doing the non-profit, because that gave us the flexibility of doing things that we thought were interesting, um, you know, without having to have commercial consideration because I think that if you had both, then ultimately it would be difficult to, to you know, you, you'd be left sort of... So you're really trying to tell the story in that case. Yeah, so, so that was really, I felt that uh, there, was, there wasn't a place that people could go to to see what was happening in contemporary art, because, specifically because the gallery, that, there were so few galleries, and, and there were some good galleries, but they, weren't, they were never places that people went to really for, you know, for, uh, to, to enjoy, like, a, a, on a weekend, and, and it wasn't even just about art. It was also when I moved to Yangon in two thousand and eleven, there was really a lack of things to do. So I really thought that young people would benefit from a place that they could go to on the weekends. You know, whether or not it was it was an art show, or it was a coffee shop down down the street, or it was um, you know like a pop up shop that they could enjoy. So that was really the original mission. And then now, as we go into the you know the second um, iteration of TS One, we I think we will have more a <coughs> more defined mission, which is, which is really to try and encourage um, uh, uh, an engagement with, with art and culture from, from locals. Yeah. So actually, you actually hit the nail on the head with my next point, which is how do you build an audience? I mean, even in Hong Kong, which is a highly commercialized art market hub, yeah. um, we are still building an audience where on the weekends you might get a coffee and then you stroll through the galleries, or now Tycoon is open, which is a big new institution for us. Um, but creating that habit is actually, I think, something we're all working on. Yeah, I think it's a very, very long, Together. long term. Yeah. You know, it's you know, you grow up with it. You know, that's why in, in very developed markets, you know, in, in Europe or the United States, people go to you know go to museums. They've always done that, so it's really normal for them. You know, and, and in Hong Kong, we're, we're just beginning to build that now because in Hong Kong, it's a different country where everyone's so used to going to shopping malls. So it's like, you know, that's like the equivalent for shopping. us in Hong Kong. Yes. <laughs> you know, no one, like everyone is so experienced in every single mall and knows exactly where to go. <laughs> so it's like trying to translate that, that sophistication to a museum. Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, 
Um, and wanting to now also speak about sort of, you know, because it is a nascent market, the artists are pricing at quite, you know, quite comfortable prices, let's say, at the moment. Yeah. How do we kind of work towards building that? Maybe it's an institutional conversation, if you have any comments with that, um, But there are Cambodian artists that have been, I'm sorry, um, Burmese artists that have been sold at auction for rather high prices. And so there is sort of a big gap yeah, I, I think there is, um, I think that there's, a, I'm not sure what the current prices are on the, on, on the market. I think that you know, the prices have gone up, increased, they have, so they have increased over the last few years, but definitely not in a sense that compares to, to the art that is, you know, the price of art in, in surrounding um, Southeast Asian countries. I think that the, there is a challenge because a lot of uh, these artists are not represented um, by, uh, by, by, you know, galleries. I mean, there, there, there are a few galleries who do represent artists and, and are able to help them through the process, but not all of them do. And, um, and, and I feel that they have the experience to really understand how to price their work. And for some reason, in, in, uh, artists have some unrealist, unrealistic expectations for the price of their works, and therefore they, they can, they're never able to to start building because of, you know what what they're asking for is you know too hard. I can't get it out the door. No, exactly. Okay. Um, I wanted to also then move on to depending from the Indian marketplace, and India is is quite a unique marketplace. It's very long established. Um, I went to my first fair, the Delhi Art Fair, three years ago there, and as I was walking the halls, I was introducing myself to the galleries. And they went, hey, you know, working in Asia, I'm often told my gallery's been open for two years, three years, five years. I would shake an Indian gallery's hand and they would say, I've been here for 25 years. <laughs> and so a very different type of marketplace. Um, and one that has been quite strong also on the auction field. Um, so I'd love to just hear a bit more, even, even before Christie's came in, maybe just some background information on a growing marketplace like India that maybe is sort of a few uh, a decades ahead of a like that scenario, for example. Sure. Um, in, um, in India, it's been very interesting because uh, when we look at modern art, so just to give a little background, uh, if we normally talk about just pre-independence and then post-independence onwards. So we're talking about 1940s, 50s, and no Indian, uh, there were no Indian collectors at that time, barring maybe five industrialist families. Uh, which pretty much kept the artists alive. However, what was interesting was the Europeans and the Americans who were coming, mostly Americans who were coming on these Rockefeller grants for starting, and they were assigned to start these not-for-profit organizations on the grassroots level, uh, which had nothing to do with art. But because the Rockefeller families were so interested in art, they would send these NGO people from New York and say, check out the art scene too. And in the process, the Rockefeller started a full grant for Indian artists to come to New York and spend a year or six months on residences. And also, the Americans started to get familiar with Indian art. And aside from these, let's say, a handful of industrialists who were Indians, was the Americans and the Europeans who kept all our modernists alive. Um, so that's where the market began. And uh, when, we, when we bring in the major works today to the market at Christie's, selling for four million, four and a half million each painting, these actually come from these American families. Um, so there was, yeah, there was no gallery system per se, but it were, these were the American, uh, Americans who would ask, or the French, or the Europeans, other European countries, they would come and they would ask these Indian modernists to go off and study abroad, and they would facilitate it. So Razas, Sousas, they were all either um, in London, or New York, or Paris. And when they came back, some of them stayed back for life, and some of them came back to India. They also got their younger generation artists excited and showed the path to go and learn and look at 
actual masterpieces in Paris museums. That's how we proved in terms Cultural of cultural exchange was very important. Yes, yeah. it was really important, and there was actually a steady flow of back and forth. Um, and it is at that time most of the frame shops became galleries. So you have one of the oldest um, uh, gallery called Kemold today, which is one of the uh, biggest galleries, most reputable galleries for contemporary art. It comes from chemical molding because that's what the frame was. It was a chemical. I had no idea. Yeah. So she has, it was her parents. She's amazing. Yeah. 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 Shirin Gandhi. And it was her father who ran the frame shop. And then it, it became, once the market became a little more stable because of these foreign foreigners or tourists coming and buying Indian art, the market pretty much began like that. It's interesting, I think, that, as, as, as I was saying in my introduction, that a market can't really exist on its own, right? To get growth, you really need to have that kind of global exchange, whether it's museum groups coming in. Um, with art fairs, we see that happening a lot, right? Traveling museum groups um, coming in for the fairs, coming in for the Biennale or to Hong Kong for our Basel um, is a huge part of the discussion point and the discovery um, of other cultures and, and other contemporary works. And I would, I would like to add here, you know, culturally, buying art is so new and but the market has so rapidly grown because if you imagine India, people, I mean the first forms of art that we see there, I mean aside from the historical, it's mostly temple art, like temple sculptures and temple architecture. Religious. And the first thing yeah. that a person from India or Indian origin doesn't think, how can I bring it back home? You know, you go to a site, you look at the art and you come back home. And so most Indian families in the 50s or 60s had calendar art on their walls, which was from Ravi Varma's time. So it's a very new phenomenon of uh, wanting to collect, and it's grown very rapidly um, over the last 20 years. I will say we see a similar thing in Hong Kong, which you think of as, as part of our market, but it's a small um, circle of collectors, I mean, as you know. And I think we are, you know, I worked with the art fair in year one, 2013 when we first launched our Basel. And it was how do we get people engaged? How that there is money there, people are spending money, but how do we get them to look at art as a possible interest or hobby or asset group or whatever it takes to get them you know, involved? I don't know if you have any insight into, into that because you also have a space in Hong Kong. Yes, yeah, so which we should design, but I think in, in Hong Kong, it's um, I think Art Bounce has, has done a very, very good job at doing that. You know, from the beginning, there was art Hong Kong through to Basel to to today. I really think that it's really in, done a good job at engaging a lot of um, new collectors um, of all ages and all professions. And it's nice to see that because uh, definitely now people are doing the art fair in Hong Kong. A lot of people, who are not not necessarily collectors, will go and see if they will, could buy something. You know, and and, and that's and that's changed. that's definitely a visible difference from before. Art TV, for example, on, on mobile, we'll, we'll see first time buyers bidding at auction and they don't have a collection. They're not adding to something. Um, I'm sure shaking your head, maybe there's something similar, but they're first time buyers and they see something they like and, and they're going in for it. So um, I think the, the consideration of art is something that you could could purchase or you know could have in your home, could live with, is certainly widening. I was talking to Shalini about this at dinner last night. I think that in Hong Kong, the way to do it is you have to first take like sort of ex explain that it's the same as shopping, and then then they will then they have they develop an obsessive um, interest in, in what they're buying, and then through that they develop an interest in art, and then they educate themselves. And I've seen that through uh, I've seen examples of that happening. Hong Kong is quite unique in that it's just a commercially driven lifestyle. Um, but I think so much of what we want to do is highlight the culture and the practice behind the artists and their works. Um, in, uh, when I was speaking with Dukanshana before this panel, she told me something quite interesting. I think for anybody uh, currently involved in the art world, you would know that you know, sort of in the US or the UK, an auction house and an art fair would never work together. It's a huge no-no. The galleries will get very upset. Um, but in India, that we worked closely with Delhi Art Fair, the Kochi Biennale, what are those partnerships like, and how do you support each other? Um, most of uh, our partnership with the art fairs or the Biennales, and yes, in the West, it's a complete no-no. 
um, auction houses are kind of put down uh, because we are a marketplace. <laughs> so um, I think where we come in is we come in as sponsors. We can sponsor educational programs. So we won't sponsor an artist in the Biennale. I mean, it's unheard of uh, in Venice Biennale uh, that an auction house can do something. But I think for us, um, this is our way, one way to give back because we are a space for commerce, but the commerce is not going to exist if we don't educate our next generation. So as an auction house, it's a big focus for us. And so we go in to, let's say, India Art Fair, and we will sponsor an entire program of uh, flying in various scholars from, let's say, various museums uh, in New York or London uh, or various parts of Europe. Uh, because it's something that's very attractive for the um, Indian audience to have speakers come, not only from India, but everywhere else. Uh, and everyone who is involved in, uh, in any shape or form in the art world shows up at the art fair. And it's the same thing. It's good for everybody. It's good for yeah. everybody. And it's a great audience for us. It's great branding for us. We are not branding ourselves necessarily only as people coming to sell art in this uh, country. Um, so it's it's the education platform, and it's the same with Kochi. And then now there's another uh, fair that's begun, it's called uh, Serendipity, which is uh, every year in Goa, uh, started by an industrialist. Uh, it's a beautiful multidisciplinary uh, event uh, for five days with culinary arts, performance, uh, literature, um, it's really well curated. So we do a whole day of conclave where we fly in scholars from around the world and we have panel discussions. So it's all about education. So that's our way of giving back to the community. And that knocks on our, our talk from this morning and also from yesterday how important education is um, to help not only the, the market that these events are existing in, so maybe um, in India, in Hong Kong, or in Kuala Lumpur, but also to educate the international community about the practices that are taking place here. Um, I think we speak very often, you know, part of Artsy's business is press, or global press, right? And a lot of times what people ask me is, you know, how do we get more coverage for Singapore or Kuala Lumpur? Um, and it's really difficult for us, I think, because we're trying to hold a global conversation. And as there are more art fairs and more auction houses, some might say, I don't know that I take this opinion, I'm open to other people's ideas, um, that you know, artists are really pressed to create works that they know will sell. And so what does that mean? Maybe their works are of a certain size, um, works of a certain medium. Um, and I, I think there is concern also if there is some kind of globalization of, of art practice or even of contemporary culture um, so that we can all engage in one, one giant dialogue together. Uh, and Macabre is a bit of a, of a cultural um, analyst. <laughs> if that's the right word to say. Um, and she writes a blog called The Tropicalist, which I really urge you to read if you haven't had a chance to read it. I've not seen another um, kind of media content provider that looks at culture in this way. Um, and her, her medium is analyzing it through botanicals. Um, and you've coined a word called globalization. <laughs> um, I, I actually Maybe you can too. go into that. Did you not come up with it yourself? No, no, it looks it's actually that. an actor <laughs> who came up with that word. Okay. Um, but I, I think this is uh, a challenge for um, any artist, uh, no matter their medium, right? Um, you want to create a piece that feels true to you. At the same time, you got to eat, right? So you know you need to make something that will sell. So you have your audience always at the back of your mind, but you know it's this constant battle. You're sort of that's playing out inside, right? I, I, I want to, like I said, be true to myself, but I need to make something that somebody with deep pockets is going to be able to understand, right? And um, I feel like if you're um, an artist from Malaysia or, or Burma or, um, sorry, Myanmar, and you know, these are sort of more younger markets, um, you know, there's there's always this this, this challenge of okay, who, who, is, who is going to be my buyer, you know? And um, this is actually why I, I was thinking, you know, 
um, when you were talking uh, earlier, Jennifer, that maybe it's helpful to have an Asian marketplace for artists and creators from smaller countries, you know, because it may be easier for their message to be understood by people with a somewhat similar background. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, right? But, you know, an artist who's creating in Yangon might be more easily understood by a buyer in Indonesia than, say, a buyer in the United States. Um, but, um, you know, for that to sort of translate into commercial viability, we need more of uh, an Asian marketplace. And I, I just don't know if we're there yet, right? I think we have quite a long way to go before, um, I've noticed, you know, even, even in, a, in the so-called ASEAN region, you know, there's, I don't know, I've, I've got to ask people in the audience, you know, how much do you really know about other countries in the region? You know, like I, I remember um, I had a, a reading group in Singapore and, um, you know, uh, some of the members were from the Philippines and, you know, we, we read the Buru Quartet uh, by Pramodiano Tatur, you know, the Indonesian writer. And I'm wondering, he's very famous, but how many people here know of him, you know? Um, but that's the kind of thing you sort of need to do to develop an Asian marketplace, you know. But it's still, I think it would still be easier for the artists to sell into that marketplace then than to sell to somebody, a buyer in New York, because that's even more culturally distant, you know. That's just my take. Um, and I think as we see more art fairs pop up regionally, there's a new one in Taiwan in January, there's a second one in Singapore next year at the end of the year. The hope is that, and I think I've spoken to some of the founders of these fairs, um, the direction is really to drive them towards a regional focus so that people can really have more of a dialogue with locals and people coming in. Um, and I think with sort of the, this globalization, you know, certain mediums have proliferated. Um, and when in a conversation with Tapanjana earlier, she really kind of educated me. There were two artists that I found very interesting uh, that are well known, but were not on my repertoire. Um, Jangar Singh, an Indian folk and tribal artist that the auction houses have picked up and is being shown globally. Um, and what, what medium does he work in? So, Jangar comes from a, a tribe in India, from Madhya Pradesh, central India. And Jangar was trained to paint warli paintings, which are normally done on walls. And he would use pigment, which are uh, natural pigment. But a uh, photographer, Simran Gill and uh, Warren Gill, uh, a lot of them started working with these artists, and not just Jangar, many others, where Jangar would go and paint over their photographs. So I think Gory Gills was the most successful um, uh, example, which now uh, has been acquired by MoMA, by the Tate. So it brings out a very beautiful dialogue between what was considered to be craft, as we spoke about in the morning, and what is mainstream. And I think it's a beautiful way of bringing the two together because there's no reason for it not to be together. Because they are all equally brilliant in their own ways. How does somebody like that get started? Or how do you recognize talent at an early stage? I mean, for anybody, Lindy, if you have any comments here, or Ivan, you know, if you're browsing an art fair or browsing an event or you're in a village, I mean, how do you spot something that's unique and, and special that you think um, could get some traction behind it? Well, my concern is uh, with so many more art markets and art fairs and the ever-growing interest in art markets and buying art, and the world becomes increasingly um, connected in one big community. I just wonder about everything becoming, there's a sameness that we have to be very careful yeah. of. And I think the idea of always wanting, knowing there's a new discovery out there, and then suddenly the joy of a new discovery is gone because we've seen so many art markets and fairs and so many wonderful art, so much art. So I think because it's in a way what I do is that I'm teaching people to draw in a very classical way. 
and there is in fact a very big distinction between good art and bad art. And to me, good art is something where a person has a very defined knowledge. It's as important as science. Art is not just an emotion where you do squibbles on a page. Good art is all about having a very fundamental and very detailed knowledge about uh, optics, and perspective, and atmosphere, and the way shadows work, and the way the world operates. And when you see someone's painting where they're demonstrating this knowledge, I think you can say this person has the potential of being a very good artist. And there were people who do this quite naturally. I've had students like this who come from physics, maths, and chemistry have never picked up a pencil and because I'm teaching architecture and they have to learn to represent the world around them and they have to think of their ideas that they have to express very quickly through a drawing. Um, I've seen some really quite brilliant people coming out of nowhere, out of the ether and they've come and they're extraordinary artists. So I think there's also a culture within Asian culture that um, we were talking about Russia earlier uh, the discipline that students have in a school system where they become very, very, very good drawers because the school is disciplined and they have to learn to do beautiful line and shading and representation in a way that our <coughs> Western uh, students are much more freewheeling. They're far less disciplined. They rely more on emotion and feeling and because I want to do it and I'll do it when I want to and I won't do it when I don't. So that freewheeling thing is not necessarily a good thing for building up a wonderful artist. So I know myself, if I go to um, somewhere and I see a lot of art on the wall, I always gravitate immediately to the one that has a bit of knowledge about <clears throat> where the sun was and where the shadow falls and how well they've done the rendering and just how they've understood the scientific aspects of drawing. Well, it's interesting you say that because in yesterday's conversation, I think somebody in the crowd had pointed out that there was too much discipline in kind of the education system in Asia towards the arts. Um, but you're saying that there is a certain level required, that uh, creativity comes from a certain level of knowledge also. Well, I've been around long enough to see when I used to go to Thailand when there were elephants in the main street and I would go to the Thai leading art school and the students, their idea of an art school was to repeat exactly what the masters before them had done. No one ever, ever did self-expression. So I saw a lot of Thai art that was just repetitive from the masters. And that's a discipline, that you at least learn to do magnificent line work, you do all of this. Now it's a very expressive market. So the countries that have you know, gone ahead with a good you know, economic program, good boost, um, I. I think the discipline, underlying discipline, is very important, and I see my students who come with an underlying discipline, they do become magnificent artists. And you've got to tell them how to see the world differently, not to draw from what they know. I mean, not to draw from what they see, but to draw from what they know, or from what they sort of feel. So emotion is very good and very important, and that's what differentiates a mechanical drawing to a true artist's drawing. If I could add here, you know, when I was in an art school, um, I mean, of course, there was this um, uh, really escaping into abstraction because we didn't want to do life study, and um, you know, there was like a little shortcut sometimes we would take uh, or do a composition, and we didn't want to go uh, and do a life drawing somewhere. Um, and I think all of us had a little bit of that. However, I remember my professor at that time saying, you have to really learn how to draw to actually your case in point. You really have to know how to draw in order to be able to break it. Um, so, uh, and if I, uh, I would give an example like Cy Twombly. You know, when you see his works, if you see one work of Cy Twombly, it's a big blackboard with just scribble. Or Gerard Richter. You know, it's just squeegee, paint, and, uh, paint with squeegee all over a canvas. But when you see their retrospective, and you see what painterly these artists were when they were doing these figurative works, and how their work has evolved, you can actually see exactly what you're saying. That, 
you know, they knew how to paint and they know how to paint and that's why they can break and go into a level of abstraction that is so beautiful and so sophisticated. Thank you so much. Uh, when I was chatting with Lindy, and to be honest, I had to really look up the craft. I mean, what is the definition? How do people think about craft? Um, and one thing that really stuck out in my mind, I guess, because I work more in contemporary art, is the, the utilitarian aspect. And so just hearing from everybody here today, I'm just thinking, is it easier to say to somebody who is not currently an appreciator um, or a collector to look at maybe design works or craft works that provide a purpose and maybe that's step one into appreciating aesthetics and then step two is maybe then um, to looking at, um, at artworks that are more sort of for, uh, for observation, for appreciation uh, versus for a practical purpose. Um, does anybody on the panel want to speak towards that? <laughs> art for a practical purpose. Well, I've worked a lot in hospitals actually, and um, I've recently done the creative art strategy for the Royal New Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Beautiful, beautifully designed hospital, and I've done a lot in um, America with the arts and health movement, with, with Patch Adams and John Graham Cole, various people, and that is art that goes into a hospital that cannot be um, dramatic, cannot be hurtful, it cannot be anything but providing a wonderful feeling for people who are very sick. So art takes on a utilitarian purpose of being a healing mechanism. And I've met many muralists who've gone into hospitals and they do beautiful murals and, you know, there's a colour scheme that must always be in a healthy environment, a health-giving environment. Usually hospitals are not healthcare environments, they're sick environments. People used to go into hospital and become more sick because they were like battleships. Increasingly, they've got a horrible smell, they've painted horrible colours, they've been on corridors like a submarine. There was nothing about them that gave anyone any sense of peace or restorative or hope. And um, so now that art, and particularly through this um, arts and health movement, which is very strong in the UK. They were the first ones to start doing it. And um, then America took on. So it's probably been in America 30 years and about 40 years in the UK. And Australia is now doing it. And um, the whole thing is you've got to, there are healing colours. And there are colours that give you a dramatic, like red. You never paint a red wall in a hospital because that's blood. So you have to paint them cool colours, soothing colours. But you can't make it so bland that it lacks interest. But um, we, at one point, painted out the cardiology unit quite a few years ago with my students using an Aboriginal artist. And the doctor, Dr. Jim Wilkinson, had come from the UK. And um, we painted it with my students, and then I had Ray doing most of these wonderful myths and legends, Aboriginal legends, and he'd never had any training. And I know I'm Australian, but there's a wonderful Aboriginal artist called Lynn Onis, and he paints these wonderful, mystical, wonderful mythological stories. They're real like fairy stories, but exquisitely painted. And Ray Thomas painted exactly like that. And um, Jim Wil Wilkinson, the doctor, said it was just a magical thing to see him painting on the wall, this untrained artist, and how it just came out from within him. So wall after wall were painted, but unfortunately, unfortunately, that was the hospital they pulled down for the new one. And they were all on the wall, so you mustn't ever put murals on them permanently. But um, I think art in hospitals is extremely valuable, and it is really uh, sort of there for a purpose. And it's not just art for art's sake. Yeah. Thank you for that. That was a, a perspective I had considered. Um, I guess if, finally, I wanted to also touch base about um, about platforms, not, not specifically artsy, um, but sort of the, we're in the age of information. Um, somebody can start their own WordPress blog. Um, somebody can open an Instagram account. Um, there is so much information out there. Um, and in speaking with somebody that I met here yesterday, I think one comment was that you know Malaysia doesn't have its own um, art publication. And I, to be honest, I, I looked at him and I was like, neither does Hong Kong. <laughs> um, and actually what we found successful there is, you know, 
the, the beginning of art criticism, um, just starting columns in our regular newspaper, the SCMP, um, in the, I don't know, the Hong Kong Tatler, um, and just giving some airtime. And I think instead of opening a separate publication that needs to look for a new audience, um, sometimes it's, you know, contacting and reaching out to the existing audience um, and beginning an education process there. Um, we are so much, you know, bamboozled by all the images and, and details and what to look at these days. I wanted to ask the panel and you know, take myself out of it because I see it's a media publication. Um, but how do you sort through, maybe Ivan as a collector, how do you sort through everything out there when you're looking through Instagram, like when you're you know, there are blogs about who's buying what and all of that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very overwhelming. It, yeah. And it gets more and more so. I mean, you always discover a new account that you need to follow, you feel like you need to follow. I mean, it's, it's a lot out there. And text-wise, I, mean, I think, um, with our art publication, I think we also need to think about, you know, what the audience wants these days and, and how to appeal to them in terms of content. You know, traditionally, um, obviously, um, essays and things like that are quite, quite long, you know, and the reality today is that people have a reduced kind of, um, um, what's the word, like, attention, attention span, time. attention yeah. span, and I think, it, yeah, it's, it, it's, a, I think those messages need to be more, much more concise now, um, especially because it's not only just a lot of sites or publications, but also artists, fairs, um, I, I, there's a lot, so so I mean I think on Artsy you guys have an editorial platform where you do do some reviews of of shows and in quite a concise form. I think that's very useful. For obviously you know, the academic stuff will have to remain, um, and but the, I think that there should be a differentiation between the texts that I use for academic purposes and the ones that I you know use to appeal to. A public audience. So then an artist starting an Instagram account on his own is still effective? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I've discovered things on, on Instagram that I've not, not seen before, especially, you know, in maybe in countries that, that don't participate in the art, global art ecosystem. Maybe it's, you know, from, from a, a, an African country or from a Southeast Asian country. And, and that's, that discovery is through, through Instagram. Burgeoning artists in the crowd, it's free. Sign up for an account, get your work on Instagram. Um, yeah, please. Um, actually, to your point that there is no um, journal dedicated to art in this country, I think more and more the entire uh, platform is moving to digital now. So even like in a space like India, uh, there are just two journals. It's the Art India magazine and another magazine called Take. Uh, and they are also reducing more of their presence. They used to have four a year, now they have three a year or two a year. And most of them are becoming, these writers are becoming bloggers. So people blog and uh, it's interesting that you can not only blog what you see and what you believe in and you can put your opinion, then you get paid. <laughs> because Google will pay you if you put a little banner on top, so it's a nice way to make a little money as well. <laughs> if you run, <laughs> yeah, you have to put the paid ones. <laughs> so I, I think there are ways to um, spread the word. Uh, I have an Instagram account, and it's all about art I see from around the world. Not necessarily what as Christie's uh, I'm selling or my team is selling. But if I see something great and that moves me, I uh, put it out there, I make a little film out of it, and write a very short note <laughs> on it. Because you're right, the attention span is so little. But it's a very easy way for me to share what I just saw. And you don't even have to go there, at least if you can't afford to go there or you don't have the time. You at least have a sense of what's going on. And I think that is a huge... Uh, asset we have today, which we didn't have as students ourselves. And you know, in, in the past, people obviously followed uh, critics, you know, specific critics or or columnists or writers that they they uh, know over time and they like their point of view. And what I love about the social media now is that you can you can have that same relationship with these accounts. Like you don't know the person individually, but because of what they've posted 
and what you've engaged with that account, you realise that, oh, you know, you, you put it on and you make it a point to go and see what they've been looking at. And that's broadened, I think, our access a lot more. And if I, if I may, with my very cursory understanding of Kuala Lumpur in, in the two days that I've spent here, I think what I've heard that there is perhaps, you know, within the art community frustration that there isn't a dedicated journal, or that, or that um, the focus on art is not so much in, in the education system currently. Um, but I hope some of this, you know, inspires everybody there that you can, you can do it yourself. You can put the word out there yourself. You can look for information yourself. It's all available. It's all online. Um, the education process is always a long conversation, even in Hong Kong. Um, it's still kind of a, a building thing. When I grew up in Hong Kong, there was not a single gallery. We had no museums. <laughs> hope that doesn't age me. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, and even nowadays, we're still kind of struggling with that. Um, but what we see is, is it's all being privatized, right, across Asia Pacific, where governments are, are not putting money into museums. I mean, I spend a lot of time in China, that's one example. There are a few great museums in China that the government is behind, but it's largely a privatized effort. Um, people putting their collections into places where visitors can go and see um, and understand what they're doing. And um, so yeah, I do hope that with, even within the private sector, there could, there could be some movement um, on that in a place like Kuala Lumpur, because we've seen that really work well in China. I think that was it. If I could open the questions out to the crowd, um, would anybody like to? Oh, hi, Shalini. Um, It's a really good question because I think all of us are constantly thinking about this. And um, when we started the um, contemporary aspect of the modern and contemporary sales, um, moderns were easy because we knew who the modernists were. But identifying who the contemporaries are from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, the regions we cover, um, was not that easy, nobody had done it. Um, museums weren't really doing uh, shows uh, or bringing out Indian artists or South Asian artists to the West. Um, so it pretty much started with us going to the regions, um, going to, and there were no art fairs that time either. So we are talking about uh, early 2000, there was no uh, India art fair, there was no Kuchi Biennale. So in a growth market, like South Asia, it started the other way around. Mostly in a developed market, in a um, evolved market, it's the curators that find artists, and the auction houses follow, uh, the galleries follow and pick them up. So the galleries nurture a stable of artists, and then the curators will go see those and follow those artists and pick them up. As the museums and institutions pick up these artists, auction houses pick up those. Because an auction house's job is not to find necessary artists, but create benchmarks for prices. However, in a growth market, where there is no institutionalized you know, identification of these talents, it, the onus becomes us on us. And so what we started doing was we started doing studio visits. We started going to Lahore, we started going to Karachi, we started going to every major city in India, uh, in Delhi, Bombay, Baroda, Kerala, down south, uh, Dhaka, in Bangladesh, Silet, um, so, and Sri Lanka. So we started going to these places and 
it was over the years we identified artists that today we represent. So we we would go, we would identify a few artists, maybe pick one or two and represent them at auction. We would keep going back and seeing how these artists are evolving and where we can bring, uh, what at what price level can we bring because it's a lot of, a lot of the collectors rely and believe in us and so it's a huge responsibility when I'm selling something today for 10,000 and five years down the line if I'm selling the same artist for 100,000 um, I have to make sure um, that there is an evolution, there is a belief and there is potential in this artist that it is going to be an artist that's going to be on a glo global platform. So in our case, it was all, it was the reverse. So we identified the artists. When we started selling at auction, institutions started looking at it. So let's say the MoMA, the Met, the Tate, they started looking and they started sending their curators to these regions. So we have so many artists who were first, including Zarina, Hashmi from India and New York, New York based artists uh, originally from India, who has shown at the Guggenheim, at uh, Art Institute of Chicago, at the Tate, um, at the Hammer Museum in LA. You know, she, I still remember we were the first people to put her out there and she was already in her 60s. And nobody knew about her practice barring a few minor galleries. And once we put her out there at auction and we uh, sold it successfully, boom, she became this big phenomenon. So, you know, it starts in a very grassroots level in a, a growth market where if the curators are not coming, we go out there and identify these talents. And it's a, it's a really interesting organic process and it's very gratifying. I think, yeah, I actually think that obviously these well-known platforms like auction houses and, and galleries are an important place where um, curators can discover you know, artists from a region. And I think you know, from the big institutions, often they obviously come on research trips you know, and, they, and do their study, and, and most of them are, are very talented um, to, to curators with a very good eye, so they have the ability to distinguish the what is good, what's interesting, and they can see that. And I've seen people, you know, like Alexander Monroe from the Guggenheim come and do very, very sort of you know, diligent study of, of, of the various artists working across the country. But I think sometimes, you know, there's, there is a risk of um, curators having a preconceived idea of what they want to find. And uh, because, you know, they are already formulated somehow a narrative. And, uh, and they're sometimes looking for works that support that you know and and uh, and and i think that you know, it's important that they they don't do that um i've also always encouraged the curators who come to myanmar to take on apprentices or, or have interns who work for them uh, because since we lack a formal state sort of education uh, system for for art and for art curation you know, a lot of these people have not had the exposure to the idea of curating and ultimately you know when the curators go back and they take uh, with their research and they take it back to their institution. That's the end, you know. That 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 that, that process is complete. But what you know, they can do is really pass on that um, knowledge and that um, you know know how and how to do it. And I think that's the most useful thing that curators can leave when they come and do do a project in a country. And then on the audience side, recently we did um, a show, a, a pop up show um, at TS One where we bought a, an exhibition that was curated by Cosmo Castinas, who was the director of Parasite in Hong Kong. And I think while it was, you know, it, it was, a, it was a beautiful show, the, a group show that included artists from around the world, um, that was commissioned originally by the Dhaka Art Summit. Um, and, and, um, and it was really great that it, it demonstrated how, you know, you can do a group show and weave this beautiful narrative, and in this case about um, a lot about migration and movement of people and some very topical themes you know, through art. And I think that, that sort of teaches the audience that you know, there's, a, there's a very beautiful way to tell stories through art that they might have not necessarily had the chance to see before. I would also like to add, oh sorry. Um, I would also like to add um, about 
you know, curators coming or us going to a region, you know, most of these regions that we're talking about also have artist initiatives. The galleries, even in New York, till today, we have galleries that are run by artists, the program is, is done by the artists, the artists show in there, and curators go and see and decide whether they want to collect those artists. But it is a platform that is created by the artists. And if you look at, let's say, in India, there's Coach, run by Pooja. In Dhaka, there is Britto. In Sri Lanka, there's one as well, um, Tirtha. And in uh, Pakistan, it's Vassal. All of these artist initiatives are completely led by artists. The uh, a mandate is done by the artists. And we all who are looking at these regions actually go and find these places and they always have a small exhibition room where they display their works. They have a small brochure and all of this can happen, I don't know in Malaysia if you have an artist initiative or not, but it is an incredibly um, a useful, I would say, a tool for artists to be able to go and show in their own spaces and it, it's, it's not driven by a gallery or a commercial aspect and everything goes to the artist and this is where they have these intellectual discourse and most of these were either artists who sold their works and started it or there were some uh, collectors who came together and donated that space to the artists. I'm really pleased to hear you say that DK because it's a little bit opposite to what I was about to say and what I was about to say was that I was feeling a little bit sorry for the artists because I think when this big world, this big marketing world of, of galleries and cur curators and very wealthy auction houses, the poor artist is just there for the picking and it's whether an artist is in favour or in the right place at the right time or why is it that some are chosen and some are not. So I was going to use the example of some Australian artists who um, one, I, sh I will mention his name, but I've got it from the horse's mouth, so I'm not actually making this up. But when this group of artists in the 1950s and 1940s were painting a lot as a young band of artists, um, some of them were very good, the Boyd family. And then there was another one called Sid Nolan, who was the worst painter in the group. He was hopeless. But he was a marketing man. And he went out and he promoted his work and he went and saw the dealers and he went and saw the Australian galleries and he had the charm and the wherewithal to get himself, you know, really. And he actually painted um, a series of paintings called the Ned Kelly series, which is now one of the most iconic, you know, myth-making, um, this wonderful bushranger from Australia. And he did these really fabulous paintings, but he did them not as a very accomplished artist, but he had a vision, he had a dream, he made it happen, and he went out there and got it. Whereas what I was sort of feeling from a lot of the conversation, you know, I mean, they're all very accomplished artists that you're dealing with, but so many could be overlooked in the rush to get them up on the stage. Really good point, and it's something that we've seen happen. So if you look at sort of big names in contemporary art coming from the U.S. at the moment. There's a predominant um, a segment of them that all come from North University. And there's a, um, one way of looking at it is that in addition to the, the MFA program, the Master's in Fine Art program that's available there, one of the courses you can take is how to make a right living as an artist. Um, it is a business. Um, it is like a skill you would, um, any other skill you would have, you would need to find a job and somebody to, to promote you and give you a line of work. Um, and in, um, here at our opening dinner the other day, we met, there was a gentleman from, it was the National Gallery um, here, and he had started a program, I want to call it YAS, Young Art Artpreneurs. <laughs> I think it was, that, right? Somebody's nodding in the crowd, hi. Um, and he said it was like that. It was, you know, artists and creatives from 18 to 35, uh, working across all different fields. Um, and it was a, a course on how to market yourself, how to create your resume or a portfolio that you can bring to somebody, um, how to shop your skills around so that you can then really make a living out of it um, and look at art and creation not sort of as something that maybe you could do 
you as a pastime, but really something that you do um, with your career as well. Does anybody else in the crowd have a question? Hi. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, thank you for such a coherent discussion. Um, the kind of two points that I want to circle back to. Uh, the first one is to do with something that Ivan was saying about how you may need to discover um, new artworks or artists through Instagram. And that was really making me think about how actually nearly all of our interactions with art are through seeing a copy of it. That normally we see a photograph before we see the actual piece. And there are so many things which I'd say are my, my favorite artworks that I feel like I know very well, but I'm not actually still in front of them. It's because they're in a private collection or they're in a distant country, and so I make use of things like artsy to be able to kind of get that interaction with the artwork. Um, and then that kind of is linking into a second point, which is something that Jana was saying to do with how Indian art used to be very kind of site specific. You mentioned temples as like a very key form prior to the 1940s, but that recently there's been a turn into <coughs> ownership of art, something that you have in your home. Um, and so to kind of bridge that gap in the term of medium is, is photography something that can start to be seen as a way to collapse distance and make something which is very site specific, something which is also ownable and flexible. So yeah, kind of for I think you can jump. Um, so, you know, we are seeing, um, if I understand correctly, how, how this gap is being bridged between what we saw in temple architecture to photography or Instagrams and the digital media. Um, it's a really organic process, you know, there's no rules of how things are happening. Uh, it just takes very few people to make these movements happen. Um, so how, how does one start collecting to start with? Like why, why was a culture that didn't collect any art all of a sudden start collecting art and then you inspire one another and it's, it's you know, it's something art becomes more accessible when you've actually got your food on your table you've got a home, you've got your car, you've got your children's good schools, and that's when you're thinking, oh, I could, you know, live, enrich my life a little more by having some art, or engage intellectually with some artists, because most, most younger collectors, more than just the process of acquiring, it is actually the interaction they have with the artists, the studio visits, um, and the interaction they have with the fellow collectors of and the chase, you know, especially because I come from an auction world, uh, there's always a chase. I'm chasing great art to bring to the market. My collectors are chasing the same great art to bring to their homes. So there's always this tension of, am I gonna win it? And then the, once I've won it as an auction house, the collector is thinking, am I gonna win it? Right, so all of this is actually happening very organ organically. And in the process now, as Photography as a medium today is more accessible. There's editions, so I think there's a surge in that um, uh, in that market space. Is because one can actually afford art. So everybody is able to like people are also doing a very uh, renowned photographer from India, Daini Das Singh, who's had shows around the world, uh, including MoMA. Um, MoMA has actually just acquired one of her uh, very important works. Um, she's also doing offsets. So it's not just her main prints, which are limited edition, but she will do offsets where uh, she uh, sell them in the form of these books. And there are like 12 images that you can hang on the wall, and each month you can change it like a calendar. So you have a rotating, so people are coming up with really creative ways to get their art out there. So, I mean, Danita doesn't have to do anything. She is a world famous artist. 
she's not just an Indian artist or a South Asian artist. Every museum has her works, including Tate is actually was just showing her works a few months ago. She doesn't have to make that of her, but she wants to make her art accessible. So you know, this bridge is actually happening and being uh, uh, happening from both ends, like from the market side, from the artist side, and the collectors. And if you see in most of these, uh, at least the countries I oversee and follow very um, closely, there are so many private museums coming up. Because the collectors are not only collecting, but they also want to share. So they are opening up their collections to um, the public. So I think it's a wonderful way of tracing this evolution of where we started and how uh, and where we are today and how um, art has become so much more easier uh, to uh, have a dialogue with. Um, every, everyone who wants to can actually have a dialogue today with the art. It's not an elitist space anymore. And with, I mean, uh, where your question was about the uh, seeing things in, in images and the bridge to seeing them in, in reality. Yeah, it's kind of to do with how photography mediates our yeah. interaction with the art form and it's not necessarily a direct. No, I think, I mean, I think obviously it's a, a, impossible to see everything, you know, in, in, in person and, and it, with art, I'm sure that the, the feeling that you get, the emotion, you get will not it's not fully realized until you see it you know in proximity but I mean that's un unrealistic to be able to see everything but what it allows you to do at least identify um, something that you're interested in and then if it's something that interests you enough then maybe you will be able to visit go and yeah seek it chase it find I mean uh, funny you say I mean like recently um, I thought of I was at the um, design Fair, the Salone de Mobile in, in, in Milan earlier this year and uh, I felt it, actually the opposite of, of that was I, I thought I'd, I actually didn't need to come because um, I could just sit at home and dedicate you know, three hours a day during that week to look at all the Instagram images and by that I've seen enough sort of products to really get a sense of what they would feel like and if I, ever I came across one where I didn't I would then go and try and see that. perspective right? people call us disruptors and I think when we first launched the company's quite young it's only been about six years there was really a lot of sort of misclarity and, and the industry really wasn't sure about us you know were we going to replace the art experience and that's never possible and certainly not the goal the goal is that you might see something and then find a way to go and see it in person um, yeah sorry there was somebody just behind you that raised their hand hi Good afternoon. Uh, just feedback to the panelists uh, regarding uh, some of the art scenes here in Kuala Lumpur. We do have the uh, independent uh, artist run art space like Lost Gems, uh, Minu Inuit, and uh, Rumah Ayat Panas before as well. And I would like to ask the, your view on non gallery setting kind of exhibition like we know Documenta in Kassel, Germany, and also the uh, Public Art Sculpture Festival in Munster, in Germany. So. So how, what is your view on this that really bring art out of a gallery to the public spaces? Do you want to use? Um, yeah, sorry, I was just thinking about your question. Um, I think it's extremely critical, actually, to bring it out of the gallery space. Um, public art is something that I really enjoy. I spent a lot of time living in New York where there's a public art fund. Um, and, and what they do is to bring sort of large-scale works into, into parks or, a, you know, roadways so that it's part of a, a, um, a civil community's, you know, uh, communities. You might see it on the way to work, for example. Um, it's something that we're just starting to uh, build even in Hong Kong. Um, so much of, I mean, Hong Kong commerce and, and other regional commerce really depends on the land developers, right? Are they willing to let the curators in? Um, and to, to direct a show or host something in their property. Um, 
I don't know Poland, of course, so well. I can't say in Hong Kong the conversation really starts with the land developers. And in the last few years, we've really seen that window open up. I think what they realize is that, and maybe it's you know for their own purposes, they want to bring in the audience and they want the audience to stay. <laughs> they realize that if they put artworks there, they will stay um, and engage with it. But it's and maybe it's you know for them another angle to sell their to, you know to bring traffic to their retail stores. Um, but I think for us in the art community, it's a great way to also reach a new audience, right? Somebody maybe would not be willing to walk into a gallery on a Saturday, but hey, um, I'm in this mall and it's the weekend and there's this amazing piece here. There's a developer in Hong Kong called New World Development um, and a collector behind that, Adrian Cheng. And what he has um, become quite well known for in China is something called the K11 uh, Art Museum or Art Foundation. And they're basically giant retail outlets, they're commercial malls. Um, and within each of them, I think there's five or six across China, there's a museum space, a dedicated museum space. And that way of kind of mixing commercial with art has been really successful. So you go to the openings in Shanghai, you know, I'm sure you've been to Ivan. Um, and there's a lot of people, and not just art world people. You know, people that you know, saw it in the advertising for the mall and made it out and bought a ticket for 100 women because they wanted to see the show. Um, they are then able to kind of merchandise off of it and things like that, and I think that's great. You know, it's it's causing a spark and an interest, and people are engaging, and that's really the point of public art. I'll just add, uh, we've just had the Lawn Sculpture Biennale, which is all about public art, um, four kilometers along the coastline of the Great Ocean Road in Victoria, which is one of the great beauty spots in Australia. And um, this image up here was one of the sculptures. It attracted about 120 entrants and 42 were finally chosen. The curator was the curator at the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. And having a public art um, exhibition like this for 10 days, and Australia being a small population, attracted 65,000 visitors, which was rather a lot and uh, they had to travel two miles out of Melbourne to get there. So having public art along the ocean, or there's one up in Sydney called um, Sydney um, Sculpture by the Sea in Sydney, and they've got one in Cottesloe in Perth. But the idea of putting sculpture in all sorts of sculptures, every possible type you could imagine, but maintaining a very, very high standard, was really a great thing for the public and a great way of introducing art to uh, sort of unversed pu uh, public. So the public really do enjoy it. It adds an enormous amount of um, pleasure and zest and enthusiasm amongst not only the locals but all the visitors too. So that's public art in Australia. Um, so I just actually want to give an example of um, how public art can sometimes work really well, but sometimes it can't, you know. So it also depends a lot on the piece, for example, right? And um, this is not, um, so I don't know how many of the people in the audience are familiar with, um, there's a city in India called Chandigarh, and uh, it was designed by Corbusier. And um, there's a, a sculpture of an open hand that's um, quite iconic uh, to people, I guess, who are interested in art. Uh, it's in Chandigarh. Uh, but, you know, the, the really interesting thing about the whole Chandigarh project was, uh, so after independence, um, uh, the, the Indian Prime Minister invited uh, Corbusier to design a city, you know, this vision for a, a modern Indian city with these beautiful sculptures. And um, sometimes when these projects are too top down, they're not adopted by the grassroots. So Chandigarh may be a beautiful city, but it just, never took off as an actual organic city, you know? Um, so it can, it can go either way, you know? Put out there. Speaking of India, um, yeah. the, and again, pardon my ignorance for, uh, uh, about Malaysia and how things happen here, but I remember um, there was a whole program post-independence India around the same time that you're talking about where it was mandatory that if you're making a building, you have to have a certain space allotted to art. So that was a time in the 50s and 60s, 
all the buildings built, which were public buildings, had to have a mural. And these artists did these murals. You have to have, it's almost like a CSR. And they had to leave out a space for a mural or a sculpture. And it's beautiful. You see on all these cities like Madras, Calcutta, all the major cities, Bombay, um, Delhi, there are beautiful murals and sculptures along these um, along these uh, buildings, and it was because the government had made it mandatory. And uh, that's how, when we were in school there, we were um, there were again uh, not many galleries or exhibitions that we were uh, seeing, but it was this public art that actually introduced art to us. So it plays a very important role, and I, I'm sure there are aspects of that here as well. Or you could enlighten us about it. There's, so there's an interesting sort of coda to the whole Chandigarh open hand um, story. Uh, so a few years ago, when the Singapore government built the Art Science Museum in Singapore, the architect uh, uh, behind that museum, uh, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name, Moshe Safdi, he's Israeli, uh, he had actually spent a lot of time in Chandigarh. And so, um, if you've seen the Art Science Museum, you know, it, it, it's an open hand. Uh, so basically, it was sort of inspired by his time in Chandigarh. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just interesting to see, again, like another sort of top-down um, effort. Singapore is nothing if not a top-down sort of society. Um, <laughs> at public art, and um, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, again, that it's been hugely successful. I mean, it's, it's hard to say, maybe it's just, it's too early, or you know, maybe there'll be a generation of Singaporeans, you know, be like, wow, you know, it was because of that museum it sort of changed my whole, uh, gave me my first exposure to art, but um, I just, I don't see a lot of people in that space, you know, like, it's, it's so fancy and kind of, in a way, it's almost a little bit unapproachable, you know? And that's not really what you want if you're going to do like a public art project. I don't know, that's just my take. Uh, maybe I would just like to feedback. We do have a auto art uh, festival as well. Uh, Sasaran Art Festival and also Pulau Katam International Art Festival. Whereby they will engage the international artists to come in the residence for two, three weeks, and they put up a show of the art, and even conduct a workshop as well. So this is a showcase that the bottom art from the artist going into our side. And also regarding the publication, we do have a periodic publication, not journal, but periodic publication by Rock Art before. It's the lady from the M Plus, it's the lady you made, and it's funded by Bank of Ghana, by our uh, national bank. I'd like to just go back to a point you raised, Jennifer. Um, I think the benefits of digital platforms are amazing. Can you imagine 10 years ago that an artist in a kampong in KL or even a village in Myanmar, now, through things like Artscape and other platforms, from that kampong or village, you can get it out to the whole world as long as there's internet connection. But aren't there dangers to it? Um, and a few things I would like highlight. Firstly, it is the, um, the validity of them. You know, what you see, sometimes the digital image, it doesn't truly really reflect. And you have a lot of cases where they say, oh, that's not what I bought. The image doesn't truly really reflect the, thing, the physical thing. Uh, number two, our experience, we built a library. And um, two things. Number one, you can't get publications now. More and more publications are going digital. And number two, people aren't doing research in the library. Even my team do research at the desk. So this issue of coming to a library and meeting people and doing research there is going. And, and, and number three, someone like Shmini put so much effort into making a gallery a piece of art, the physical building a piece of art. Now maybe they don't go to physical galleries, they go to digital galleries. And keep trying to, I don't know whether in future they won't do physical auctions, just do digital options only, you know, I mean, now there are digital options, but now there are digital options. So are there these dangers, are these dangers real? Do we fight it or do we just accept it? Thank you, those are very thoughtful questions. Um, I think I'll address first one, the question of um, authenticity. 
Um, and there are galleries before they come on our platform that ask that question. That like, hey, you know, what, the JPEG's going to be up there. There's no watermark on it. How do I keep somebody from from replicating it? And to be honest, that part of it will be out of our hands, and it's not specific to artsy. I mean, Google Culture, you can like zoom in on an exhibition at the Met. You can make somebody if they wanted to. You know, small town in Shenzhen maybe are making a replica painting. <laughs> you know. Um, but I can say that all of our um, art galleries, and we're very uh, careful about selecting who really goes on, um, and they are kind of certified galleries. We've spoken to them, we've researched them, we know what their background is, what they're, um, if they're doing other affairs. There's really sort of, we look at the full resume and the, and the lifespan of the gallery before having them come on, and part of that is to certify that uh, they're selling authentic works. Um, if and when, and I think it's very few cases that we've had somebody selling um, maybe it's it's not on print or something like that, a bit more economy, we have immediately asked them to leave the platform. Um, but I think in any large scale marketplace, um, and art is unique, because art is, is are unique goods, they are multiples in any marketplace, but there will always be sort of that possibility of fraud as information gets uh, more and more easily shared. Um, and I don't think, I think in addition to kind of the age of information, we are also in this age of like experience, right? Um, and that sort of immersive experience that I think we're all really much value and very much seeking for. And so I think because of that, I don't, and I hope not, <laughs> that the digital age will ever replace a real life visceral experience. Um, we hope that it just encourages, encourages you to go out and seek that real life experience, right? I think of like the rain room, for example. I've seen tons and tons of Instagram posts, but I really want to go see that in person. <laughs> you yeah, know, because you're. I, I, I agree with, with with that. Yeah. I think the information and in the online is is um, is the sort of a, a bonus in addition. It's a tool to see and and, um, and have access to more knowledge, but nothing will be able to replace the physical experience. And I certainly don't think of, of anyone I know who's interested in you know in art or who who would ever think that they can be replaced by an online experience. But I think what it will do is encourage people to make that experience richer. So you know people who own uh, spaces and galleries to make sure that, you, that it is worth the visit. And you're more educated about it upon your visit. Yeah. Upon leaving the visit, you might do some research and learn more about it. And to answer your question about uh, digital auction, <laughs> online auction, as opposed to physical, um, it's interesting because we think about it a lot, and we have online auctions as well, uh, as do many other auction houses, which are just things that come in the on online. But as Christie's, we normally put a certain threshold uh, below which everything goes into online. Um, it's a way for us to funnel a lot of property into some into uh, a digital platform where we don't have to actually use a physical space to showcase the works. But it was a funny it's a funny thing ha that happened to us, and I've shared with you all. Uh, two years ago, we had a new marketing director join Christie's who came from the print world, and he was asked to give his advice on. Um, uh, whether Christie should get rid of all physical catalogs. Now, especially in a growth market areas, and we have many, not just Asia, but also Latin America, where we are just growing those uh, markets. Our catalogs are things people actually read, they keep, there's a lot of research that being done uh, uh, that people like to have at all times in their libraries, because there are not so many books or journals or art history or art historians who are writing you know, books every day. So these catalogs actually become these great archival repositories of information on works and artists from those regions. So, um, and this gentleman came to Christie's and said, get rid of all this. And he probably became the most hated man in that entire company where all the specialists went uh, completely uh, viral and lived with them and didn't uh, want to hear of it. 
However, he then reduced the size of the catalog. So there are different things people are trying because it's also people are conscious of the environment. So you know, there's I think there's a huge thing about going digital, but there there are certain aspects of it that we do want to hold on to, where especially in certain markets where you need those uh, catalogs, you need those physical things that people can go to their library and have access to at all times. But on the other hand, our catalogs are from our Hong Kong sales, which used to look like telephone books, I'm sure you've seen them, uh, literally <laughs> huge, uh, massive catalogs, we've reduced them down just because we are conscious of uh, using too much paper. So we are being careful about that for the, for the environment. Yes, my feeling is that we just have to accept that computers are here and are probably taking over. I fight it all the time because I'm teaching all these architecture students. I mean, we have my, maybe 600 postgrad students. Everything is done on the computer. But the ones who are the top students in the faculty are the ones who've done the hand-drawn presentations. And I've interviewed architects all around the world. And I said the difference or the dichotomy between the drawing and the computer. They all say, you, you know, they'll do the hand drawn and they'll get the computer expert to sort of draw it up. But um, when I put up the display of the beautiful hand drawn images that my students have done, there would be 20 people around that board constantly, just marvelling at the work on of the pencil and the paper. And I just think it is a terrible thing that everyone is so obsessed with computers because although no matter how good they are and how much they replicate, hand-drawn image, um, they never quite get that emotion or that feeling or that sensitivity that the pencil gets on a piece of paper. So I feel very sorry to have to say it, but I really do think everyone's obsessed with computers. Hi. Um, I actually think um, my statement is actually similar to your question. I actually think art in person is more important than ever, purely because of the danger of the digitalization. And the trend is more than that. I mean, even for young people, when they look for work, they will look at the mission and the meaning of work. So the younger generation, uh, maybe they're more stimulus from the whole digital age or computer age. They have Netflix, they have Spotify, they have everything. But essentially, more and more people are seeking deeper meaning. So that's why more and more people are needed art in person. And also, when you see art in a digital age, um, when you compare years ago, um, how many people would actually have the courage to actually step into a gallery? Gallery can be seen very intimidating for many people, not to mention auction houses. So putting art online is a uh, well, it's an easy first step for people to get to know more about art. Maybe that's just the beginning of a conversation. That doesn't exclude real life experience as well. Maybe I just ask the <laughs> collection uh, trend of it, because for Malaysia it's very much conservative. It's still very much on canvas base and sculpture and post not so much on photography and installation art. They have also view uh, in this region. Um, and also, uh, Hong Kong, we run the microwave media art festival so for UK. And then we really bring up the uh, media art scene in this region as well. Then what is the new input for us? Okay, in terms of what mediums will be on the about microwave and kind of new media works. And I'd like to hear someone from an auction house side as well. Um, I mean, I think everybody, the media works are here, they're exciting, they're amazing shows to go to. I think everybody is deciding what to, to do with them. How do you collect new media art? How do you conserve new media art once you have it in your collection? Um, I think it's something that's still really a growing conversation. I work with, for example, like Peace Gallery. I have a lot of artists working in how to position it in a sale, how to market it. They're great experience. It's where you go in, there's big lights, it's something that you're very immersed in. Um, but is it a sellable work? Is it something that the artist can make a living from? Um, if it's a, a, a 
your work, for example, what you then purchase comes to you on a, on a USB or on a disk, how do you conserve that file? You know, uh, photography also, how do you conserve that? So there are different, many questions from all different segments of the, um, of the industry going into it. I don't know if Christie's work specific. I remember that Philips had a, a team lab work, and that was very unique, I think, right? I think uh, we, we worked on that sale before. Um, and I think that was the first time they had sold that type of work in Asia. Um, so there's a growing interest. I think everyone's trying to grapple with what to, what to do with the media right now. So, I think uh, new media, media is very exciting. It's a very exciting space to be in. And it is very much a part of the zeitgeist of our time. So uh, even as an auction house, we are very conscious of it. Uh, and what we've been doing is um, sometimes we will, like, uh, let's say there was an exhibition of new media that Guggenheim did, uh, and it represented artists from South Asia. And there were sound installations and all kinds of installations. So the way we would get involved is we would support the show. We would partly sponsor, let's say, anything for the show for collectors in order to introduce new media to them. Having said that, we also try and sell new media. Uh, we've sold uh, a room full of air, uh, which, which we sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, over half a million. Um, and what we did was this whole room was filled with balloons. And I remember taking my daughter there. <laughs> so it was a whole room full of balloons. And I, even I had no idea it was a post-war and contemporary uh, sale. And of course, we had fun because uh, you can't walk uh, I mean, around because you're just surrounded by balloons. Any space there is is taken over by a balloon. And after it sold, I was thinking, how are we going to, what are we going to do? Send the balloons? No, all they get is a certificate that says they bought the room full of air. That's it. So, yeah, and those balloons are thrown away. So, um, so there is a space for new media. On the other hand, in, um, so I was very inspired, and I said we have to bring new media in South Asian sales as well. And I thought we start a little more conservative than you know selling air. Uh, we thought we'll do an installation. And uh, the installation about, was about selling blame. So, yeah, so this is a very renowned young artist, Shilpa Gupta, who did this beautiful installation of, uh, she bottled blame. So it was little bottles filled with blood, and it said blame on it. And she went around uh, trains in Bombay, com commuter trains, and sold blame. So that if you are upset with somebody, you can say, okay, I blame you. Or so you can buy blame and you can sell blame. So she made a film out of her selling blame. And then um, there was, uh, the installation was very interesting. It was in a little red room uh, with these hundreds of bottles. And the video would play uh, where she was seen um, hawking blame. And I thought that was a very interesting uh, work, especially in our times, where we are so busy trying to blame, and especially coming from America, we're blaming everybody uh, for everything when we are actually causing more harm. So, um, so I thought it was a poignant work, and why should we sell it? Um, the management uh, was, of course, completely opposed to the idea of us selling that installation because it took a lot of money to install it. We had to build uh, all these shelves. And, and, uh, but uh, the excitement got the better of us. And we put it at auction. And we put it at a really uh, attractive price. Guess what? It didn't sell. And the reason it didn't sell was all the collectors said, especially in New York, they said, it's too much space, real estate, to dedicate to one artist. We don't have that kind of space. So you know, in terms of new media, you're always struggling with these kinds of issues of how much real estate can you dedicate to an artist with a video? I mean, do you want to have screens all around your house where, uh, with these uh, headphones? I don't know. As a collector, maybe you comment on it. Well, 
I mean, I, I wouldn't, but but I went to the, to the see the Cromlech collection in, in Napa uh, this summer, and it was really amazing to see. You know, they they had this incredible collection of, of uh, video and sound and art, and and in a specifically built house by uh, Jose de Moron that they live in, and, and it was amazing. So you know, I think it just depends on how, how it's displayed, how it's, and there's a lot of real estate that's in, to fit all this weird. One more? Does anybody have one last question? Okay, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and then, so, uh, sorry. Before you leave, Ramey also mentioned tomorrow's program. Um, there is a workshop that will be leaving uh, at 11 a.m. And then the afternoon talk, which will be with the who's an architect and collector of Hong Kong at 3 p.m. Um, so I hope to see you all again there.